Oh. Honestly, by far one of the best movies uh, around, the best movie series, in my opinion. Uh, Debatable. Really epic. Uh, I love this scene where Sam is kind of just asking the question, what kind of story are we living in? Like, what is this all about? And this is towards the end of the first movie. They've already gone through a ton. And uh, what I want to ask you is the same question that Sam is asking. What kind of story will be told about you? Ew. What kind of story will be told about you? I love the end of this, this clip because he just, he kind of straightens up a little bit. Samwise the Brave. I, I, I like the sound of that, man. What kind of person, what kind of man are you going to be in living this life? Come on. You know, if we looked at the way that you spent your money, if we looked at the way that you spent your time, if we, if we could pull back the curtain of, of whatever it is that you're showing us right now on this, this Zoom, in your relationships that you're building, in the decisions that you make, in the way that you live your life, what kind of story are you living? The title of my lesson is Living a Story That Really Matters. If I can make an observation from my own life, and I, and I think, frankly, uh, I'm not too far away from many of us here, if not all of us, we're living in a safe story. We're living in a safe story. I mean, honestly, I, I don't think really anything's going to be anything bad is going to happen in my life on a regular basis. I don't walk around thinking, oh my gosh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get caught up in a 9-11 kind of situation. Uh, Sandy Hook probably isn't gonna happen to my kid's school. You know, my wife and my kids and I will all grow up and I'll die in my bed surrounded by my family, my friends, my grandchildren, maybe even my great-grandchildren. Uh, and, and I'll be able to bless my family like in the olden days. And, and, and I'll be able to, to know that my legacy is safe and sound. Yep. But here's the reality, man. Come on, bro. That's a lie. That's a lie. Now, there are elements of that that might be true, but overall, this safe life is a lie. Not only is it a lie that I believe, but no matter who you are, we're all living that lie to one degree or another right here right now tonight you know revelation 12 9 says that the great dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent called the devil or satan who leads the whole world astray he was hurled to the earth and his angels with him you know in this passage we read that satan evil in its most purest and most vile form is hurled down and banished to the earth war famine betrayal murder we wonder why all the suffering in this world and where it all comes from look no further than the grand entrance of evil into this world as what we just read but guess what sometimes as disciples we can think we're kind of like separated from that like we're immune to that like somehow we, we are enlightened to this this point where where it is going to be a perfect life. It is going to be a perfect world. I'm in the kingdom now. Everything's going to be awesome. And Come granted, on, there's truth to that. But like Cypher in the Matrix, we can still live this ignorance is bliss and subtly go back to a life of safety and ease. We're not immune. And trust me, the older that we get, the harder that it gets to Come reject on, bro. this lie. This life is not going to be easy. And you don't actually need to be a disciple in order to figure that out. Many of us became disciples because we realized, oh my goodness, this is hard. Come on, Eric. Come on, bro. You have to be a disciple Man, in order Eric. to make sense of it all. You have to be a disciple of Jesus in order oh. to be able to see all the messed up stuff that this world has to offer and go, I know what the purpose is. Come on, bro. My brothers, the reality is tonight, I'm here to help you wake up. And the sooner, the better. The sooner we live as if we are living in a world at war, because we are, the sooner we stop living in the lie that this world is safe, that really 
in the grand scheme of things, running water, closed sewer systems, fast food, it's a totally another world that we live in. We live in a world at war. We live in the middle of D-Day, on the beaches of Normandy, bullets flying, bombs exploding, and yes, look to your left, look to your right. And the guy that was on the gunny boat just a second ago is now laying in a pool of his own blood taken out by sniper fire. This is the world we live in. And we can't see it with our naked eyes. We can't see it with glasses. We can only see it through the eyes of God's enlightenment. Now, here's the reality, is that what's going to take for us to be able to see this is us growing up. Now, don't take offense. Yeah, while some of us do need to grow up, I know there are many times that I need to grow up. What I mean is, is a different kind of growing up. God is in the business of growing us up, equipping us to be able to handle more and more. And I'm sure that many of us have been in positions in our lives where we've undergone discipline and training from the Lord. The primary way that God does this, that he grows us up, is through hardship through our persevering through suffering. Notice I didn't say suffering. I said our persevering through suffering. Paul Come said on, it Romans 5, verse 3, it says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. Come on, you see, bro. the challenge is that many of us have not learned how to persevere through suffering. And so we have not built the necessary character to give us the hope that we need in order to overcome the challenges of this life. Come on, bro. We've gone to drugs. We've gone to alcohol. We've gone to sex. We've gone to numbing out in whatever form or fashion that is. Maybe it's video games. Maybe it's sports. Maybe it's television, Netflix, whatever it is. Every one of us has our drug of choice that we use to numb out from the hard knocks of life. Come on, bro. Kick us in the face, bro. So when these things come... come, We get down and discouraged and we stay in our suffering. I mean, all of us have heard the phrase, when the goings get tough, the tough do what? They get going, right? Or as Winston Churchill put it many years ago, when you're going through hell, keep going. But instead we stop and we shrink back. Sometimes like Jonah, we even run in the opposite direction. As if something strange were happening to us. Come on, bro. We can be really surprised at how hard life can hit. We, it, it can throw us for a loop. I mean, I think many of us have story after story where we're just like, my gosh, why is life so difficult right now? I mean, here's the reality. My wife and I are getting ready in just a couple of months to go and plant uh, the seventh region of the San Francisco church in Contra Costa. We're super excited. We're like making plans. We're shuffling money around, trying to figure it all out. And then what happens? Bam, I lose my job. And then what happens? Bam, Satan hits Ariel with a huge back problem. She goes on disability. Our income literally goes not even to a fraction of a percentage of what it used to be. Amen, bro. And and I can go, what the heck? Why is this happening? This is where we find Jeremiah. Go to Jeremiah chapter 12. We'll spend the rest of our time here. Jeremiah 12. Fire. Go, bro. Let's go, Jeremiah. Tuning there, let, me, let me share a little bit about Jeremiah. I know many of you probably Preacher, already bro. know this. Fire. I'm going to share with you. Go, Jeremiah Lindley. Jeremiah on, served as a prophet to the five kings of Judah during his lifetime. He had the privilege of preaching and prophesying and proclaiming God's word to the leaders of the southern kingdoms of Judah. And he wrote the book, obviously, that bears his name, Jeremiah. And he also wrote the book, Lamentations. And he's known as the weeping prophet. Because if you read Jeremiah and Lamentations, oh my gosh, there is, there is no encouragement. There is no, like, it is just getting smacked in the face. And during his lifetime, he actually did not have a single convert. In fact, this is where we pick it up. In chapter 12, he's just coming off some really serious challenges. And maybe you can relate. People, including his friends and family, are rejecting his message and the people actually want to kill him <laughs> for prophesying. And here's the, here's the odd thing. God seems to be silent. 
God seems to be silent and not, not dealing in injustice here. And this is where Jeremiah's problem lies. Situations have caused Jeremiah to feel forsaken by God. He looks around and compares how things are going on with all the evil people around him. And he is flat ticked off. And Jeremiah goes on and gives God a series of questions. <laughs> and we know when you ask God questions, be prepared for some answers. And let's pick it up here in Jeremiah 12, verse 1. This guy, he's like, you are always righteous, Lord, when you bring a case before you. Yet I would speak about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do the faithless live at ease? You've planted them and they've taken root. They grow and they bear fruit. You're always on their lips, but far from their hearts. Yet you know me, Lord. You see me and test my thoughts about you. Drag them off like sheep to be butchered. Set them apart for the day of slaughter. How long will the land lie parched and the grass in the field be withered because of those who live in it are wicked? The animals and the birds have perished. Moreover, the people are saying, hey, we'll not see what happened to us. In other words, God, all your judgments are good and righteous. I trust you. Yet uh, let's have a quick little conversation about some of your recent decisions. <laughs> Had a little bit of trust issues here. Now, how many of you have been in this difficult times and wanted to like chat with God and you're just like, God, I just don't get it. Like what's going on? Amen. Come on, bro. Help me out. He says, why on, does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are those who deal so dirty and crooked are happy in life? Why look that? at the good things I've done. Look at all the people that I've shared with. Look at all the missions that I'm giving. Look at all those sisters that I'm encouraging. Whoa. Why don't you do oh. something about them and lift me up? You know, finally, God in no, verse bro. five says, okay, buddy, I, I, l l l my, time for me to respond. And here's what he says. Jeremiah 12, verse five. Come on, bro. As if he's kind of like a little puzzled look on God's face. If you've raced with men on foot and they've worn you out, how can you compete with horses? If, if you stumble in safe country, how are you going to manage in the thickets by the Jordan, Jeremiah? You see, God is in the business of growing us up so that we can live in a story wow. that really matters. But the only way oh that God. we can do this is by growing up. There that might go. seem like a novel concept. Like, oh my gosh, wait, I, I can only grow up by growing up? Yeah. Psalm 84, 7 talks about how God's men go from strength to strength. But that means that you got to have some strength to go up to. Come on, you got to start somewhere. For many of us, we don't have much strength to even start out. Oh. So like Jeremiah, we, we, we have to be prepared for God to strengthen us. We've got to be prepared for him to teach us and to train us and to be with us when we go through these trials of life so that we can grow up. Proverbs 14 or 24 10 says, if you falter in times of trouble, how small is your strength? Dang. God is not even telling Jeremiah that he's having a hard time and things are going to go well. Like God doesn't say, hey, Jeremiah, everything's cool, man. I understand where you're coming from. Here's what I'm about to do. He doesn't. I mean, if he ever wants to get to a place where he doesn't falter in times of trouble, like us, we have to grow through faltering when times are good. And we become stronger and stronger as we go through what God puts us through. Come on. But again, fellas, too many of us are blown away by this. Uh, me included. Too many of us get like, like bogged down. I mean, this is what God is about. And this is what we must surrender ourselves to every day for the rest of our lives. No matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, no matter where you came from, God is in the business of helping you and me become stronger men. And he will do whatever it takes for us to get there. Come on, bro. Oh, the Eric. question is, oh, are you going to give up? before he's done. No. Come on, bro. Oh, there it is. Again, notice God does not provide a defense for what's happening to Jeremiah not today. or how he's going to vindicate Jeremiah from all these people. Instead, God, in essence, just tells him that he's going to be stretched more than he can imagine. And God is stretching Jeremiah. 
And there are a few things that I want us to learn from this passage. Jeremiah, it says that Jeremiah is running with men on foot. Now, running with footmen is what the King James says. And God calls the problems that Jeremiah is having right now footmen problems. They're light, they're momentary, they're insignificant in the grand scheme of things. The Old Testament days when people fought battles, they would send out, and you've seen this in many movies before, they would send out their foot soldiers or what's called their footmen uh, before they would bring in the heavy horse, before they would bring in some of their more trained, seasoned uh, soldiers. And they were not very powerful, they were not very heavy, they were not well armed, but they were, they were always a lot of them. They would just try to overwhelm their opponent and take out as many of the front lines as possible to make it easier for these other guys to come in. And, and let me put before you, Satan is no different. Satan sends footmen into your life to weaken you. He gives on, you Eric. problems. People Ooh. are persecuting you. It's a footman. You've been disrespected. You've been misunderstood. You've been cheated, rebuked. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. You've had disagreements, not enough money to pay the bills. Children aren't going to listen to you. People bringing up your past, no promotions, can't even get a job. These are all footmen problems to God. And they're intended to wear you out and discourage you and cause you to give up. Come on, bro. But here's the cool thing. Here's the cool thing, guys. Check this out. I'm checking. When you have footmen problems in your life, that means you're headed in the right direction. The enemy never sends footmen if you're going the wrong direction. The enemy isn't going to throw a bunch of stuff at you if you're not living a righteous life. The enemy isn't going to try to derail you if you're headed in his direction. That wisdom. So what do we need to do? As James says, we need to celebrate when we have footmen in our lives. Come it means you're, gonna, on, you're doing something. You're going somewhere. You're having an impact. You're headed in the right direction. You're heading for your purpose that God has for you. This is why, again, James tells us that we should rejoice when we face trials of many kinds. They're helping us get stronger. They're testing us, and they're proving our resolve to be genuine. The text tells us that Jeremiah was being worn out from running with men. Brothers, do not let them wear you out. Say no. Stand up to it. Some of you know my story. I became a disciple at 20, uh, went through the fall of my faith when the ICOC crashed in 2003. Uh, A few years later, got married, um, when moved to my home state of Alaska, where we were marginalized for standing up for biblical convictions, um, lost all our friends. And frankly, my wife and I, just a few short years ago, if you really count it, were on the brink of divorce. Um, and so we made a desperate move to try to save our marriage, to try to save our lives, really, on, bro. to Denver, Colorado. And our intention was not to uh, do anything but join the the international uh, uh, churches of Christ out there. But I put a Facebook post up about having a quiet time, a a devotional with anybody that wanted to in the area. And a man named Jeremiah Clark answered the call. I don't even know why I was friends with him on on Facebook. I I have no no idea. Welcome to the kingdom. But the reality is that step was the first step in a trajectory of life that would lead my wife and I to a restored marriage, to our hearts restored back to God, to our dreams of serving God full time restored, and now actually like happening. We didn't know. Let's go, bro. We bro, didn't know. Come on, Eric. And that, that is a Cliff Notes, ver- that's like half a Cliff Notes version. My wife and I have Let's quite go, bro. literally been through hell. And it's all had a purpose for me to be right here. We should have lost our minds, Come on, but bro. we're still here. We should have quit our marriage, but we're still here. Tons of men would have thrown in the towel and said, man, forget this. 
I'm 42. I have kids in a family. Do I really want to go through with all this when all I have to do is just hit the button, sit back and cruise? Come on. But we stayed the course. And our, our aim is to stay the course for the rest of our lives. Come on, bro. You know, I remember the first D time that I had with Fernando and Jackie. He looked me in the eyes and he said, Eric, we're going to work hard to help your marriage get strong. He said, we're going to work hard to help your, merit, your family get strong. We're going to work hard to help your faith get strong and to train you in Ariel to become an evangelist and woman's ministry leader. And you're going to lead a region and you're going to go plant a church. And you Let's know what go. I did? <laughs> I just looked at him and went like, okay, cool. I didn't believe him. Go I didn't on, believe bro. him. I'm like, hey, bro, I'm behind you 100%. But, you know, hey, the, the reality is this ain't happening. Come on, on, you don't know what I got. You don't know my drama. You don't know my baggage. But guess what? It's happening. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Let's go, God, Eric. God has made it happen. Well, he did it. Not without go, a fight. Eric. Not without yes, a fight. Sir. Even now, choosing to grow and keep going, no matter what, it is a fight. It is a battle. As Paul says in Philippians 3, we got to forget what is behind and strain towards what is ahead. Here's what I love about this passage in Jeremiah 12, 5. And I hope you guys memorize this passage. God wants us to run with horses. Why would God compare and contrast running with men and running with horses if his intended purpose was for us as men to not run with horses? His intended purpose is that we would be able to run with horses and, and to be able to navigate with the agility of navigating in the thickets by the Jordan, to handle more and more, to grow stronger, to become smarter, and to have more and more faith. God presents trials only to prepare us for what's coming next. And this is why we should be fired up in the midst of hard times. Come on, bro. Come on. Now, why should I get excited? If all this, if, if all this light and, and momentary stuff is just going to get more intense, why should I be happy about it? Because the greater the trial, the greater the treasure. Nobody who has ever gone through anything great for God or experienced the greatness of God without going through difficulties. Mom. The tests of the trial is what helps us grow. You've got to go through something in order to get where God is trying to take you. Now, what's fascinating is, again, this idea of running with men versus running with horses. In order for us to become the men, the leaders that the kingdom needs, we've got to be those that run with horses. Running with men is not going to get there. Many of us right now, tonight, are spending way too much time running with men. Whoa. We are spending way too much time with people, with old friends, with old family, with old memories, with old issues, that's running with men. Let's go. And you wonder, you wonder why you're not where you want to be. You wonder why God's not using you the way that he, wa that he wants to and Come that on, you want to be used. It's because we're spending too much time running with men when God has called us to run with horses. Come now, on, bro. here's the reality. Naturally, we cannot run with horses. Even if you're as fast as Ole, you oh, still can't run with horses. Come on, come on, on. Ole, strong. We measure the power Ole, of bull, vehicles with horsepower. Horses can gallop upwards of 60 miles an hour. An average horse walks 22 miles a day. A horse can run full speed for several miles. They can perform in heat and in cold. They can sleep while they're standing up. How many of you can sleep while you're standing up? Aaron. Well, I can. We really can't do any of that. I mean, if we try to one with horses, we're going to get beat every time. But God says, again, as, Im as implied with the text, that we are supposed to run with horses. His intention is this. If you can make it with men, God is going to empower you to do supernaturally what you can't do with your own power. And that's the power of faith. He wants to give you the ability to endure over long distances, to perform in the heat, to perform in the cold. He wants you to rest while you're taking a stand, to not get weary with men. 
God is about to empower you, my brothers, to run with horses. Are you ready for it? Let's go, bro. Eric. Oh, no, Eric. Boom. Let's go. David had to kill a bear and a lion in order to prepare for Goliath. Then he becomes a king. Look at your life. Look at the story that you're living. Let's go, bro. That's awesome. Is this story of your life worth telling? Will people be telling your story the way that we saw Sam and Frodo talking and about the potential of their story? Because the reality is that that story that you want told is the story that God wants to write with you. If you keep going, if you dig deeper, if you push harder, he can use those footmen, those things to prepare you for what's next, to prepare you for the next level. If you're struggling with light stuff right now, I get you, I get you, I'm with you. But you've got to learn to handle those things in order for God to be able to take you from strength to strength. God's wow. plan is to empower you to do what you never, ever thought you could do. It has on, nothing Eric. to do with ability. It has nothing to do with education. It has nothing to do with skill. It has nothing to do with knowledge. God will always qualify the called. He does not need to call the qualified. And trust me, I'm a classic example of that. There is Come no on, way I'm qualified to do what God is calling me to do. But God Amen. has qualified me. Let's go. And he's going to continue to do it. I haven't arrived yet. Amen. Amen, bro. Come on, bro. When God finds someone who is available, it becomes good ground for him to use. Only then will we be able to say that we've lived a story that really matters. We shouldn't even be here. But we are. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo. The ones that really mattered. Full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't want to know the end. How could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing. The shadow, even darkness, must pass. Every day will come. And when the sun shines, it'll shine out the clearer. the stories that stayed with you that meant something even if you were too small to understand why but I think Mr. Fuller I do understand I know now folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back only they didn't they kept going because they were holding on to something My brothers, this is the story that we are living in. This is the story of a good God who loves his sons enough to train them, to discipline them, to allow them to go through little footman issues in their life, to train them to handle more and more, to go from strength to strength. 
as disciples of Jesus, as servants of the king. This is who he is trying to make us. Men who are not worn down by small things. Men who do not succumb in safe country. But the men who can run with horses. Men who are strong for the task of bringing the gospel to this lost world. Men who, when we put our heads on our pillows at night, can say like Paul that we have fought the good fight, we have finished the race, we have kept the faith, and we will be the men who get the crown of life. I love you very much. Come on, let's go. Oh, oh, let's go. Let's go. Oh, 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 oh,